This recording is notes for the Art of Framing workshop for Carfax Saskatchewan. I'm Heather Klein, and this is content from the workshop without the live demos that happened in the in-person workshop. Uh, so I started the workshop by introducing myself and talking a little bit about the fact that I have a really broad art practice. I use a lot of different materials. Uh, I'm mainly a painter, but also mixed media and new media artist. I made a shocking confession about learning the hard way to think about your framing systems. I had an exhibition in 1999 at the Mendel Art Gallery that ended up becoming a touring exhibition. And when it went to, came time to create that exhibition, we found out that my framing choices had some real issues. And so all of those frames had to be taken apart and the glass had to be replaced with plexiglass and it was time consuming and rather embarrassing to go through. So next we had people share their own framing stories with each other. I'm going to include the brief history that I played at the workshop. Uh, it talks about framing history and also how that impacts how we frame today. Here it is. My name is Heather Klein and I'm a professional artist and I have been a professional picture framer and a preparator at a public art gallery. When we think about the history of frames, you gotta wonder, is a frame just an object, just something to protect an artwork, or is it art in its own right? The history of framing really comes down to the use of line in design. Mosaics, early tomb paintings, portable art objects, that use of a geometric border to complement or highlight images, text, and even complex geometric forms. It crosses cultural and geographical boundaries, this use of line as a framing device for artwork. But if you're really looking for the roots of the modern frame, I'd say you have to look in preservation. Portable altar pieces, early book works, cases made for scrolls in beautiful, bold geometric patterns. Early makers wanted to protect their artwork. Patrons and artists saw the potential of elevating works through the use of framing systems. Carved hardwood frames sealed with earthy clay, red bull, and gilded with fine metals, silver, gold, some works even inlaid with ivory and fine gemstones. Some frames were designed based on fashion. Some have complex narrative that complements the artwork. And others were just the whim of an artist or a patron. In the history of framing, old frames were often discarded for the fashion of the moment. And beginning in the 18th and 19th century, artists and dealers started to use ready-made frames that could be moved from work to work. This is why a lot of the artworks were created in standard sizes. Sound familiar? Region, nationality, and style all influenced framing. In a way, the history of framing parallels art history. Technological innovation, experimentation, and sometimes just taste and fads have all influenced framing. But woven into that history is artistic authorship. Individual artists who designed, created, and sometimes hacked together their own frames. And we can't forget that poverty, war, and hardship have sometimes influenced artist choices in framing. So how does this history of framing impact how we frame today? Artists really do need to consider presentation and preservation of their artwork. Yeah, speaking as the owner of a commercial art gallery and um, having work from artists that we want to pass on to clients, clients are very interested in the quality of the frame, making sure there's longevity, that it's secure, that they can take the piece right home and hang it right on their wall knowing the frame is sound and secure and protecting the artwork for its life. Yeah, my, my big piece of advice is really respect yourself as an artist. 
think of you, the future of that work. And, um, you know, like sometimes I get artists who they, they say it's all about the concept, you know, and then, but then they're selling their work, right? And then it's like, then they start to think about the, the future of it. And so it's kind of like this dichotomy. To me, it's like, think about all of that right from the start and think about the aesthetics. So, you know, what's going to make it look good, but also what's going to make it last? You know, you don't know what your future is. Maybe you're going to be another Van Gogh, right? And how, how would you like it if that, you know, these works that you're doing now and that you've spent all this time on, you know, you end up sticking them in some cheap mat that's got, you know, wood pulp in it. And then later on, 50 years down the road, it's got all this staining around the outside edge or, st or staining coming through the paper from the back because you stuck cardboard as the backing or like all those kinds of things. So, you know, do it right from the start in looks and in conservation. That's my advice. Should artists frame their artwork? I think definitely depends on, on context. Sometimes some work looks good without frame. At least we anticipate it looking good without frame. Maybe it might be a light excuse not to frame. But I think uh, overall, I think artists should really frame their artwork. It really does change the dynamic of the piece. That, that little uh, narrative environment, I think, needs that little bit of help. And I think it looks good. It reflects on you. It, it looks much better with frame. Yes, in early careers, of course, everything's dependent on how much money you have in bank and pocket. I picked up some really, really bad cheap wood in the early days of my career and um, stretched canvas, painted on canvas and ready to hang on a wall. And, and the canvas looks like a warped hockey stick sitting on a wall. So the evolution is learn your materials. If you um, always buy good materials. It's just there's no excuse not to buy good materials and um, learn some of these traits. If you can if you can learn from people that uh, know how to, to build frames, go after it. Uh, there's always resource information on how to build good frames um, and it's worth you know it's worth going after. So my evolution is that I'm doing it myself now and um, uh, with more knowledge, learn from people that really knew what they were doing and uh, have taken that knowledge and am happy with my frames. <laughs> How are you going to frame your work? How do you like your work to look? But something you really do need to consider is not only how your work looks today, but how it's going to look 10 years from now or in the centuries to come. How will you frame your work? Start off the next part of the workshop by talking about paperworks, and I thought it would be smart to hear from Brenda Smith, who's an art conservator who has very strong opinions about paperworks. Um, say if it's a paperwork, well then what I always recommend is make sure that it's archival mounting. Make sure that they don't use tape. I mean that's another thing that I come across where you know somebody's had something framed and the t then of course in some future time you want to reframe it or something something changes. Maybe it had acidic mat board on it. Then I have to get it apart and it's been taped masking tape gets more and more um, insoluble over time it's hard to remove it causes staining same thing with um, scotch tape some of them you know so i always i'm going for like get archival quality use photo corners are all like archival now they're polyethylene right it's easier to remove it Th that kind of thing those are my standards always have like a good backing board on it have have your depth you know if you're going to use plexi or, or glass in front um, they each have their plus and minuses. Plexi, you can get UV. If it breaks, it doesn't break the same way as glass does, but, but glass is more impervious than plexi and it doesn't flex, you know? So they have to think about all of those kinds of things when they go. But after that, then it's, um, it's their choice, you know? So we're gonna start our paperwork process or looking at paperworks by talking about properly measuring artwork for matting. Matting is one of the most conventional ways of handling paperworks, and there are kind of standard sizes of mats that we've gotten used to seeing. It's usually about a two and a half to three inch border that goes around paperworks. So there's a clever way of measuring using a ruler 
by just adding that six inches onto the amount of your artwork that you want to show. Or if you're gonna have a float, you just add that additionally. So we'd make it six and a half inches plus the width of our artwork. I demonstrated this method at the workshop and I hope you all remember how it works. The other thing we talked about was whether you were cutting a mat for a custom frame, a frame that was gonna be made to fit the artwork, or if you're trying to cut a mat for a ready-made frame, you have to reconsider how you create your sizing system when you're using a ready-made frame. You might not be able to have an equal mat of three inches all the way around the piece. It might have to be weighted at the bottom. It might have to be slightly narrow at the sides. These are the things that you have to deal with when you're cutting a mat for a ready-made frame. And you'll remember I mentioned that when you are looking at the sizes of ready-made frames, they include the allowance. So if it's an eight by 10 commercial ready-made frame, the actual inside measure of the rebate, that inside edge, is eight and one eighth by 10 and one eighth. However, you'll remember I suggested to always double check your frame size. The other thing I wanted to talk about at this workshop was the different qualities of mat board that you can buy. Everybody claims that their mat board is acid free, but not all acid free mat boards are made the same. Uh, Crescent and Bainbridge make some very good 100% rag mat board, um, but you really need to check when you're buying your mat board from your local store, whether you're just buying something that's buffered or if you're buying totally acid free board. And the other thing I wanted you to realize is that as soon as you start using colored mats, no matter how good a quality they are, uh, even if they're 100% rag, the dye in the colored mat can become an issue over time and affect your artwork. So the next thing we did was we watched a demo. Please refer to your handout for notes on how to straight cut a window mat. Of the mat board knives that you see on this image, I actually like to use an 18 millimeter knife. I find it's, I've got a good grip on it and I can handle it well. Next thing that we talked about at the workshop was choosing to frame or not to frame. This is an image from an exhibition that I had, which was a series of over 70 prints that I chose not to frame, but to hang on the wall. Uh, I think in retrospect, there were some good things and bad things about this choice. One bad thing was I sold very little of this work and having seen pieces framed and presented framed now, I recognize that the work really looked a lot better when it was cleaned up and framed. However, I wanted to show these works in groupings and I wanted to have almost, a, I wanted a certain aesthetic from the display in the show. So I weighed that against the framing uh, and decided to just display these paperworks unframed. I used a clip and wire system so that I wouldn't put holes into the, the uh, pieces of paper. I also worked with a really good quality hot press watercolor paper for printing on so that my paper had a little more stiffness, a little more durability. Um, but I don't know if I would do this again. So now we're gonna do some sharing or we did some sharing in the workshop. Here are the factors that I think you need to consider. Um, is this meant to be a temporary or permanent installation? If you're just putting up something for a couple of days, maybe you can make that choice not to frame it. But maybe you'll have that issue I had where it devalues the work. Also, how fragile are the mediums in the artwork? You gotta think about if the artwork is on rice paper, if it's pencil, if it's a loose medium like uh, pastel or charcoal, you really have to protect it. You have to cover that with a glass or some sort of um, surface so that you don't disturb the artwork. The other thing is, are you the only one dealing with the work? When you're sending work off on a traveling exhibition, for example, like my Mendel show, you're relying on preparators in other places to be able to install that work. Be kind to your preparators or to your gallery dealers or to anyone who's exhibiting your artwork and think about how they can deal with what you presented them. And again, you really do have to think about, you know, maybe frame fewer works, but honor your work by setting it up for success. And I think that's what a frame can often do. 
Um, also, frankly, if you're being commissioned or paid to do something, you are responsible for it. And you really have to think about the longevity of what you presented your client with, or very quickly you'll be in trouble. They'll be bringing it back to you for repair, or, you know, you might not be commissioned to do work again. So you have to think about that long-term impact on your career. When you put something out there that's of lesser value or makes your work appear to be of lesser value, uh, it can have long-term consequences. The other thing is don't tackle framing that you can't handle. If you don't have carpentry skills or experience, find someone who does and learn from them. Take a class at the Bockwell, but don't try to work with materials because you think it should be easy because you watched it on a YouTube video. Putting wooden frames together properly is actually quite challenging. Now metal, for example, is a great choice for beginning framers because pretty much anyone can put together metal frames. You might want to get them pre-cut by somebody at a local art store. Ready-made metal frames are often pre-cut for people. Um, you can cut metal frames though on a standard chop saw. You just have to make sure that you use lubricant. That gives you a nice clean corner. So think about two things. Think about do you have the skill to proceed with the path you're taking and think about economics. And sometimes you can blend the two. Maybe you get somebody to build the frames, but you cut the mats and glass and put it all together. That can be a real cost saver. And again, longevity, longevity, longevity. And, you know, I'm not talking about just, you know, 10 years from now. The reality is in Saskatchewan with our climate, I've had wooden frames that start to separate within six months, some which I've had custom made. So not only do you have to uh, choose framing that has longevity, but you have to know and demand good quality framing when you're getting it done custom. Uh, any wider frames really have a tendency to split out. So you need to really be aware of that when you're choosing framing profiles. And uh, do some research, look into what kind of framing is not only practical, but also long lived for the style of work that you're trying to frame. Next, we're gonna do a demo. And in that demo, I'm gonna show you how to do a standard T-hinge. I also showed you some examples of folded hinges and S hinges. That's more for your information. The hinge that we're gonna use is the standard T hinge. And you'll see that they're offset on this diagram. In your handout, there's a step-by-step -step instruction for how to do the T hinge. So please give it a try. I also threw in these examples of other kinds of hinging methods that work good for when you're floating artwork. So keep this in your back pocket for if you want to try to do some more um, sophisticated matting of your work. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, this is the big conundrum, and that's aesthetic choices. Because a lot of people will say that it's the artist's right to make any choice they want. That is true, it is your right to frame your work any way you want, but you really need to think a lot about what your purpose in framing the work is. If it's just to go up in your house, go for it, put a pink mat on it. But if you're trying to show your work in a commercial gallery, or if you are trying to sell your work at local art fairs, you really wanna think about trying to hit some sort of standard or neutral framing that's going to appeal to the most people and also that's gonna set off your work. You, you want it to be about your artwork. You know, when you buy a, a postcard from a foreign country and you put it into a mat that's the color of that country's flag, that's fun, that works. But when you're taking your own artwork and trying to showcase it, you don't want the mat to be the best part of the work or the brightest part of the work or the most eye-catching part of the work. And same with the frame. So put your art first is my first advice. And then think about neutrality because that's not only going to appeal to the most people, but it's going to appeal over the longest period of time. You know, what's going to be in style 10 years from now? Well, you can't really go wrong with a German silver frame and a white mat. It's been in style for the last 50 years. So make, think about these things because as you build up a body of work, you might be showing it 10 years later or 20 years later. 
And you don't want to have to reframe things all the time when you're showing them to others or showing them in exhibitions. Um, I actually have to say that I'm a big fan of um, stock wooden frames in neutral colors, like this beautiful maple frame, although I will point out that the corners are not very well put together on this frame. If I was buying this from a framer, I would complain about it. But the look of it, and why I like this wood is because it's really forgiving. When you have a black frame, it can scratch so easily. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm gonna let Brenda Smith rant a bit about that in a minute. But wooden frames are actually the most durable. They're the most forgiving. And you can hide scuffs, scratches, and marks on them a lot more easily than colored frames. So let's hear Brenda's rant about this. I would say is really hate, hate. You know, the new black frames everybody buys because they kind of look nice and they're cheaper. They mark so easily and chip so easily. Don't like them. That's my personal thing. I understand in terms of finances and stuff, but you get what you pay for. They will mark even with gloves on. And also if you're painting your frame, matte paint also marks very easily. So just my personal little tips. That's, that, that's it for my off the top of my head. So here's kind of my framing checklist. So again, we're talking about neutrality. We're talking about things that complement work and never go out of fashion. You can't really go wrong, I think, with neutral metallics like flat black, silver, German silver, um, and also make sure that those metal frames are anodized. This is a better quality finish, an electroplating finish, that's not going to scratch as easily as painted finishes will. I, again, swear that maple, ash, and oak in a simple square profile, you cannot go wrong. It's been in style for hundreds of years. It's fairly economical and um, they're durable. You're gonna be able to reuse them on other artworks. And don't forget from the very beginning when Brenda was talking about cardboard and masking tape, it's okay to throw a cardboard backing board into a wooden frame if you've got a piece of acid free matte board backing between the cardboard and the image, the artwork, but you don't want it anywhere near your artwork. It's so acidic. I've seen the damage that it's done. It's really unfortunate that artists put cardboard anywhere near their work. And masking tape too. It can cause a real nightmare as scotch tape as well. Our final demo is going to be a simple method for panels. I did talk really briefly at the workshop about canvas panels and canvas works. I'll show some samples. But I thought I'd show you a very doable framing system for panels because they're becoming more and more popular and you can buy them now, really nice birch panels at your local art store. So this framing method utilizes a ready-made frame or it could be a custom frame. I actually like making up this custom molding. It's pretty simple. And a backing board covered in canvas or linen refer to the step-by-step -step instruction in the handout to get a reminder of how to do the simple panel framing. The final thing that I wanted to talk about was hardware because I think even if you buy ready-made frames and reuse them you should replace the hardware on them. Generally commercial frames come with really poor quality hardware that's often difficult to mount on the wall. You can buy a variety of sizes of hangers at your local art store and even at many hardware stores. They are durable, they work well, and they're gonna add a level of professionalism to your work, regardless of whether you're using a ready-made frame or a custom frame. They're sized to deal with the weight of an image. Easy rule of thumb, the heavier the artwork, the tougher and bigger the hanger. Never forget to pre-drill. You'll see I have that in our handout. I have split several wooden frames by skipping that step and trying to quickly apply a hanger. I also wanted to talk a bit about wire. You can buy wire a lot of different places now. You can buy it at Home Depot, you can buy it at the dollar store, but I do think it's worthwhile to buy good quality braided plastic coated wire. Braided is what gives it its strength. You don't want to just be using a piece of, uh, you know, bailing wire on an artwork. 
It's also flexible. It also is not going to mark your wall up, especially if it's covered in the plastic coating. The plastic coating protects your fingers, but it also protects your walls when you're trying to get the wire up and over your hooks. It's not super expensive, especially when you think of the amount that you use per frame. I highly recommend it. As well as the little black bumpers that you can put at the corners of your frame to protect your wall. That brings us to the end of the PowerPoint reminder of the framing workshop. I hope you enjoyed the workshop and take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>